All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gotham Writers Inside Writing. Today, we're going to be talking about commercial fiction. But first, some announcements. As you may have heard, the Gotham Writers Conference is going on Zoom for October 16th through 18th. Registration is open on the Gotham website, and we'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Also, at the end of the show, uh, we're going to talk about the Twitter pitch party for how to participate in pitching your story on Twitter. And lastly, we have a, a special episode of Inside Writing coming up on August 12th, where we're going to be evaluating query letters. So if you want to have your query letter evaluated on the show, stay tuned for instructions for that at the end of the show as well. Now, on to the business of the day. Remember that at any point in the show, you can submit your questions for the Q&A segment uh, after the, the initial panel discussion. I see some of you are already using it, but uh, on, the, on the Zoom dashboard, there is a Q&A button. You can submit your questions there. Uh, now let's talk about commercial fiction. We're going to start with a quote from Margaret Atwood, who said, all fiction is about people, unless it's about rabbits pretending to be people. It's all essentially characters in action, which means characters moving through time and changes taking place. And that's what we call the plot. We're gonna talk more about that quote later, but now let's meet our guests. First off, literary agent and founder of the Bent Agency, Jenny Bent. Hello, Jenny. Oh, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am, hello. There she is. Hi, Jenny. Uh, and, and Jenny's client, author of Nedley Tan's Book of Luck and Fortune and Vanessa Yu's Magical Paris Tea Shop, Roselle Lim. Hi, Roselle. Hi. Hi, thank you both for being here. Uh, let's start the questioning with Jenny. Just a basic definition, what is commercial fiction? I saw that someone asked that in the Q&A and it's actually sort of a hard question in some ways and I know it makes it so challenging for authors as well. Um, so first of all, the easy part of it is that all genre fiction would be considered commercial fiction. So if you're writing romance, science fiction, mystery, thriller, um, all of those are considered um, commercial fiction. Um, also, like when you look at format, like anything that would be released in a mass market format, and um, I can't see people, so I don't know if people know what I'm talking about. Um, but when I say mass market, do people know what that means? Generally, it's like the shorter, I can go get one. It's like the smaller format um, paperback. I'm trying to find one right now. We just moved offices. Aha, uh -huh, here's one. So like this, the smaller format is going to be commercial fiction. Um, but then it starts to get a little murkier. Um, and for instance, this book, which is called The Flood Girls by Richard Feifeld, to me kind of fell on a line between commercial fiction and literary fiction. And sometimes when people, when books straddle that line, we call it book club fiction. Um, and I, I think, and th this is another example. I sort of always thought of this as a more literary novel, this The Night Tiger by Yang Chu, but it, it was a Reese's book club pick. I mean, I think it's another one that kind of straddles that line. And I think maybe one of the things that distinguishes it is literary fiction is often more character driven. It might be more um, about, it, it might sort of present sort of a philosophy or an idea in the course of the writing. Um, whereas commercial fiction is often, pacier, it's, um, it's often more plot driven, it might be more high concept than literary fiction. Um, so I think I've rambled enough. No, I think that was a- that <laughs> was a <laughs> But it's hard. I mean, the point being is it's hard and you don't always know outside of genre fiction and what one house sees as literary fiction, another house might position as commercial fiction. And in that case, it really becomes about the packaging and the way it's presented and marketed. Mm -hmm. So, Roselle, with your query, which we're going to get more to later, you classified your book as a literary multicultural novel with magical realism. So you didn't really consider it commercial fiction at the time. Has that changed at all through your first book through now that you have three coming out? Um, definitely. It's, I, I think I've done a better job of 
picking up the pacing and increasing the tension and the conflict, which is leaning more towards commercial fiction. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, I asked uh, when Jenny signed me, we were talking about that. And it was, I think my spot is more up market, isn't it? Like, yeah, you're more like women's fiction, a market, but you are, I would say you skew more commercial than literary in the sense that, um, and that's what we sort of had that talk about. I was like, this isn't exactly literary fiction, um, because it is, it is sort of heavily plotted, um, not, not sort of a more like character study or meditation the way I kind of see a lot of literary fiction. And and Jenny, uh, more and more, I'm, I'm hearing writers who classify themselves as something on, in their query only for that to change. How important is it for a writer to know where they fit to classify their book correctly? Or is that something an agent will help them with anyway? Um, yeah, we can, we certainly help with sort of, it's very hard, like I just said, for an author to necessarily know, especially when you are talking about that spectrum of literary book club commercial. So yeah, I mean, I think that's easy enough for us to kind of position it um in a in a certain way Mm -hmm. i certainly wouldn't hold it against somebody i mean if they totally got their genre wrong like they told me it was a romance and it was really a thriller i would be like this isn't exactly a romance but it's not we we sort of work with our clients to help them Mm -hmm. roselle i'm curious because you mentioned that you you picked up the pacing a lot in your book so how has your writing perspective changed from the release of that first book which you classified as literary to now having your third third book coming out in 2022. Have you, has your approach to writing changed at all? Jenny converted me from panting to plotting. She knows. (laughs) (laughs) It's um, I used to just sit down and just write and go, okay, I'm just going to write what I want. And it doesn't matter where, no, it, for me at least, like it leads to a lot of issues as in like plots that go nowhere and what is happening here. So yeah, like I started, I started now doing, um, every time I write a new novel, I always go with an elevator pitch, a blurb, and then write the synopsis. And then Jenny looks it over and tells and gives me her feedback and whether it's a good idea to pursue. And then as I'm writing, I'm always checking the synopsis. But if there are happy accidents that happen when you're writing and some, a scene needs to be inserted there, I'm feel free to just insert those happy little happy little um, ideas in there that supplements the plot. So that's, that's how I changed my writing process. Mm. Jenny, is there a big difference between selling a work that's commercial and a work that's literary? Do you take a different approach to it? It's just a different group of editors. Um, You know, the pitch, the pitch for something commercial might be more focused on plot and the pitch for literary might be more focused on the ideas that are presented or the writers, you know, people who are writing literary fiction generally have degrees. So you might focus more on their degrees, but it's, it's mostly just that you, it's a different group of editors. Mm -hmm. Um, Roselle, when you're writing a story, I mean, with literary fiction, it's often said, you don't, there are no rules you have to follow. You can essentially go wherever you want with, with commercial do you find yourself trying to stay inside boundaries or follow more of a formula or do you just kind of see where the story goes regardless? I need to make sure like I, I have like a little chart. <laughs> character arc is important, character motivation and the, the journey and all of the subplots, everything have to t- has to tie together and like you have to balance it so that with the way the story unfolds, you're addressing everything. It's kind of like juggling just making sure that each as you progress you don't lose track of a ball slash subplot as you go along Mm -hmm. you brought up a lot of interesting points i want to get back to more of character development here in a bit but first uh jenny do you you find that the best commercial fiction follows a formula that that it sort of sticks to a plan well i was gonna say no but then when rosie said roselle said that it kind of made me think oh i mean with romance, yes, there's a certain structure that obviously you have to follow. Um, you need to have like, you need to have them meet. You need to have them fall in love. There needs to be a falling out. Then there needs to be a resolution and a happy ending. So yes, obviously for mystery or thriller, somebody needs to die. Um, I don't, I can't speak to science fiction because I don't, adult science fiction because I don't read it. I don't think there's a formula for, I really don't actually think there's a formula for commercial fiction. I, I, I just think 
what Roselle was talking about is almost something every writer should focus on, which is basically, you know, how does your character change and grow and how does that fit within the plot that you've laid out so that the events of the plot are partially driving the character development and then the character development is also driving the events of the plot. So I can actually show people, I don't know if I can do it on Zoom, but I, there's like a chart I have which sort of shows the, the progression of how your character arc should really fit with your plot arc. But it's the same, it's sort of the same line. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're talking about plot, and that was what I wanted to talk about next anyway, since it's, it's supposedly the biggest part of commercial fiction. Jenny, do you, do you agree with that, that plot is the biggest part of commercial fiction? Is that the main thing you're looking for? No, I mean, I'm looking for so many things. I, it has to, I, I, for me personally, I need something to be heavily plotted and tightly plotted. That's just me as a reader. Like much of today's successful literary fiction is not something that I can read because it just doesn't hold my, it's just, it's off, you know, it's slow to start. There's a lot of buildup. I'm, I'm an impatient reader. Um, but heavily, you know, something really heavily plotted literary fiction I can read, but when it's that slow burn, it's difficult for me. But, um, no, I think for commercial fiction, the plot is super important, but it's side by side with character development and voice. Um, I would say are the, the top three. Mm -hmm. Particularly for women's fiction, I think, because that needs to be voicey. Maybe mm -hmm. less so for like a straightforward thriller. Mm -hmm. I was actually going to ask what your top three components of commercial fiction were. So thank you for getting to that already. Sure. <laughs> uh, sure. Roselle, how much attention did you pay to the plot? Like, I I'm always curious with, with writers' processes. Were you focused on the plot or did you sort of focus on your character and building out that character and seeing where the plot, where they went along in the plot? One thing that I've learned in reading a lot of craft books and from learning from Jenny when she does the editing is that like character drives plot. Like it just, it just does. So you can't have events happen without the character having agency and being involved in, in her life. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. And it, it, it segues into the, where I'm going to talk about character anyway. But um, actually, that's so true. Can I just jump in? Absolutely. That's so true that you don't want, and Rosie, thank you, Roselle, thank you so much for saying that because it is that the, you don't want the, the character to be something that the things are happening to who's just reacting. You want exactly what she said. You want that character to have agency and drive things forward and make decisions that, you know, and, but so, yeah, just, I just wanted to emphasize how important that is. Right, and that's that's kind of the quote that Margaret Atwood had too. Was it starts with the people, and the plot kind of happens to them. They they drive the plot. So, uh, I want to talk about character, uh, Roselle, with the na you know the namesakes of all your books, Natalie Tam and SCU, Sophie Go. You you put a big emphasis on character. Uh, where did these characters come from? Did you sort of conjure them out of thin air, or, or were you building them out of a, a model, or what did you do? Um, Natalie was more closer to who I am. Vanessa is more of a wish fulfillment kind of character, very like kind of happier, fluffier. Sophie is a mix of both, but a lot of these are basically fodder. Like this is why when you have writers and family gatherings, they're always eavesdropping and just <laughs> looking and just listening to all of the family draw. Like I take that in, I suck that in, it's gold. I mine it and then I pull it out when I need it when I need it for like a, a scene or whatnot, because that, that also adds a lot of authenticity to what you're writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Jenny, when you're reading a book or evaluating a book for that matter, what do you need to see in a character when you first meet them? And did you, I assume you saw those, especially in Natalie Tan. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I'm trying to think back to when I first read it, you know, when it first came in, cause it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, wait, what was the question? The question was when I... When you see a character for the first time, what do you need, what do you need from that character to be invested in them? So I always like to know the why. And Roselle will attest that I'm always pushing her on this. I'm like, why, why, why? What happened in their past? What, why are they doing this? Why are they reacting to this? Do you know what I... So it does, I need, I guess, depth um, like a certain psychological depth and understanding. So they're not doing things. The worst I think is when you read a book and you don't understand why the character is making the choices that they make. Mm -hmm. And Roselle, 
as far as your character crafting practices, did you know, we hear a lot about as writers getting to know your character before you write their story. Is that something you did? Did you sort of get to know your characters before you wrote their story or did you just start the story and develop them along the way? It's a mixture of both. For the first book, the first book, I find it to be a bit of like it's outside of the examples moving forward. But for book two, for Vanessa, I had to do this exercise. It's a writing exercise where you sit down and you ask them interview questions to get to know the character, to get to know what they're like. And then you finally like it's like you have the first answer and then you dig deeper, you get a different answer. Then you dig deeper, you get another answer. And then eventually you will get to the core of what makes this character tick and what their motivations are and what their um, traumas are. All of these things you kind of build up. And it, for me, it helps when I'm doing, I do this now before I even write anything. There's a lot of things now that I do before actually sitting down to draft. And this is one of those kind of world building kind of planning mm -hmm. exercises. And, and also uh, with, with, you know, I touched on the titles of the books already. The, the titles being so similar, it would hint that there are similarities between the three books. And given that they all came out within three years, did you have any trouble keeping things fresh? Did you ever worry about repeating old ideas? Or, or was, it, you know, was, it, was it pretty simple for you to tell a new story with a new character? In this case, I, I'm screwing it up now. You know how when you have two children and you're accidentally calling one the other? I'm writing the third book, but I keep calling the main character Natalie instead of Sophie. It's kind of that confusion, but it's for me, it's a different... I have to make sure they're all like different. They're different women. For Natalie, her, 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 self, her path of self-discovery is basically reclaiming her legacy. That's her journey. The second book with Vanessa, it's shaping her own destiny. And with Sophie, it's realizing what she's missing from her life and acknowledging, and acknowledging that and kind of claiming that. No, it sounds like you got a great grasp. You were able to spin those off right there. So I, you, you have a good grasp of what separates these characters. Um, Jenny, do, do you feel like commercial authors have a hard time keeping things fresh after a first book or is that not usually a problem? Um, I think like with my clients, what's hard sometimes is that they'll come up with these amazing, amazing concepts for their first book. And they've had, you know, 10 years more to think about it and write it. And, and, and then the second book is often in a hurry, um, because you want to, with commercial fiction, you do want to try to do a book a year or a book every two, you know, you want to keep that pace going. So I think sometimes it's just hard to come up the other problem is once you've written one book that um, the second book gets more crowdsourced. Like everybody has an opinion on the second book in a way that the first book was more sort of your own creative process. And all of a sudden the editor's weighing in, the agent's weighing in, sales and marketing are weighing in, and it can get difficult. Roselle actually didn't have that problem. Like right away, both Cindy and I um, loved her, I mean, both her editor and I, it was a two book deal and both her editor and I love that second book idea. So there, or maybe I can't remember now, Roselle. No, that was always the second book. There were, there've been other ideas along the way, but yeah. your second book was always the second book. Yeah. So Roselle actually hasn't had that problem. I think she's fantastic at coming up with ideas. Um, but, I, and, and, and you sort of high concept, really pitchable ideas that are, you sort of immediately get. Um, but I have certainly had authors really struggle with that, especially after having like an amazing idea for the first one. And then you're kind of like, oh gosh, like, what do I do? So R Roselle, you touched on this already, going from being a pantser to a plotter. Was that transition hard for you? Did you feel like you're a better writer now that you're plotting? Or is it just another method of doing the same thing? It cuts down on the revision time. It really does. <laughs> it's like less, like I spend less time pruning, just pruning all of these things, like everything. And like the, the discovery writer is great. Like I find pantsing to be perfect if you write really quickly. That, because you're discovering all of these things, then you know you have to rewrite it. And then you, if you're writing fast, it's a great method. But I'm kind of a turtle-y writer in that I write about 1,000 to 1,500 words a day. 
that's that's my like but the thing is when i write these words they're not i want to make sure they're not garbage by the end of the day so i will look them over and before the next day's writing section i want to know i have everything laid out of, of what i need to do for the next day hmm. that's very interesting um and, and i want to since i want to get into the query letter here soon but i want to touch on setting real quick so we talked about your character and the specificity there but with the titles here and, and the, the plot lines of these stories, you have very specific settings in each one. Um, how did you settle on these settings? Did they have to take place where they did or, or could they have taken place elsewhere? For Natalie Tan, it had to be San Francisco because San Francisco is the oldest Chinatown in North America. And there was no other place that that story could take place. As for the second, the second book, it had to be Paris. Um, Jenny and I were on a call with an editor and they all suggested, just go, just go. And I finally went last year. And for me, I want to be able to see, to experience the city, especially if I haven't been there before, to get the sights, the sounds, the smells, like everything from it. And that's, for me, setting is kind of like food in my books, that it's another character, like an unseen character that helps make, bring everything to life. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, for you, how big of a part did the settings that she chose play in your attraction to these books? I think a great deal because like Rosie's writing about food, there's so much color in her writing. It's so evocative. And I do love a book that will um, put me into a world where I'm not currently. Do you know what I So I was, I just loved that. I love exactly what she's saying is the reason why her books appeal to me was just, and in general, I love books that are very visual and, or sensory. Um, so, you know, when somebody does a great job on their setting and the setting becomes another character that just contributes to this sort of richer, more sensory experience when you're reading. Mm -hmm. and, and Roselle, you mentioned the food aspect of Natalie Tan the, if I if I understand this correctly, there are recipes in the book as well. Is that correct? How did you utilize that? Oh, those are my dad's recipes. There were quantities at one point. I tested them. They weren't right. I called them up and I'm like, it doesn't taste right. It doesn't taste the same as when you make it. How come it's like this? But yeah, those are those are all my dad's recipes. One of the things that I've started doing now, because I love writing about food in my novels, is that I have a set menu before I even write it before I even write the book. So for Natalie Tan, it was heavily Chinese food. For Vanessa, it's a lot of French pastries, just pastries galore. And for Sophie, it's candy. So you actually, you work these recipes into the book. Yeah, every dish for me, I don't just pick a dish at random. Every dish has some sort of significance or it ties into the scene or what's happening at the time. So I'm always fascinated by this concept that writers need to do something that's the same, but different. Um, Jenny, was this kind of like a, the difference factor, having these recipes sprinkled into the book? Um, what, what do you mean by the same, but different? Just being able to fit your book into, into the genre, but still do something different enough to set you apart from what's already there. Well, I mean, I, I don't really think it applies. I mean, it might apply if you're writing romance or mystery or something where there is more of a formula. But I think for like commercial, for women's fiction, book club fiction, um, I, I don't think it has to fit into a... For me, what I just loved was... Um, Again, like all the sensory details. I loved the character's journey. I loved the voice. There's some really beautiful lyrical writing that I really responded to in, in Roselle's first, I mean, in all of her books, but, you know, when I was reading the first one. Um, so, and, you know, plenty of women's commercial or women's like book club fiction or, or women's fiction has recipes in it. So that wasn't like you know, the make or break. We did, everybody, I remember when we were pitching it, everybody did love the recipes, but I think it's more that Roselle, again, makes it so sensory. Like, it's not that the recipe's there, it's that you feel like you're eating the food. It's that you can smell the food. It's that you feel the character's enjoyment of the food. It's that the food is really emotionally significant, and it's an emotional experience both preparing it and eating it. And I think that's what was so um, appealing about it. Mm -hmm. 
I want to keep talking about this, but I, I do have to switch over to talking about the query now. Um, so I'm going to share the query really quick. I should pull it. Oh, okay. Here we go. Oh. All right. So I assume everybody can see this. Uh, and, and if you're just listening, I'm going to read through it really quick. So Natalie Lim traveled the globe to taste all of its wonders, only to return home to San Francisco's Chinatown to confront the death of her reclusive mother. Upon discovering the existence of a family curse, she feels compelled to reopen the noodle shop her mother shunned to learn her, grand, to learn her grandmother's legacy. Cursed or not, she yearns to connect to her family roots. During the day, she uses her grandmother's recipes to help those in her neighborhood with their lost loves and new prospects. She attempts to be a matchmaker as the ingredients come alive with the magic of their own. Soon, she realizes how her grandmother connected people and fostered the community. At night, she struggles to uncover the truth of her mother's tragic life through her diaries. Her mother's wondering and dark thoughts painted the portrait of a stranger instead of, a person, instead of the person she loved. In order to understand her family legacy, Natalie needs to find the bridge between her mother and her grandmother. Her family tree casts long shadows, and despite the rumored curse, Natalie is determined to use her talents in the language of food and earn her place in the neighborhood. However, the success of the restaurant means nothing if she fails to escape the demons that haunted her mother. And then the, the, the uh, nuts and bolts of the story. At 69,000 words, Orphan Bird is a literary multicultural novel with magical realism. It will appeal to fans of the quirkiness of Amelie meets Celeste Ng's Everything I Never Told You and Laura Esquivel's Like Water for Chocolate. Um, and then a, a bit of a bio here as well. Uh, Jenny, what, what, first off, we see at the top here the, uh, what I assume was a Twitter pitch. So did you discover this first on Twitter? I can't remember. I, um, Roselle might remember better. Roselle did, oh, I think two of us had it in, right? Like me and Beth both had it yep. in. Okay, so yeah, so I must have. I must have seen the pitch and um, I, so I must have seen the pitch and requested it. Mm-hmm. Based on based on that part that's right up there at the top, that would have been exactly for people who are following along who aren't on Twitter. That would have been exactly what Roselle put up on Twitter, and then I would have seen it and favored it. it. Favored it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for those that are just listening, that the Twitter pitch was "Big Fish Meets Chocolat" when Natalie inherits family secrets along with her grandmother's restaurant in Chinatown. Uh, so Roselle. You pitched this on Twitter. Uh, what was the response like? Did you get a lot of response from it? Um, yeah, for it's, I asked a friend who's really good at pitching and comp titles, and she helped me out the morning of. And I wasn't even going to enter, but I decided at the last minute to do it. And it, it, had, a really, it had a really good response. And I think part of that is the comp titles. Mm -hmm. that I so, used. Yeah, so about the query itself, uh, Jenny, obviously this query struck a chord with you. What was it about this query that stood out to you? I love anything about family dynamics. I love everything. I love ever. I love anything about complicated people. Um, and I, I things like about, it's, I mean, everybody loves secrets, right? So you see family secrets, and that's appealing. Uh, you see the very specific setting, which is appealing. It's always more appealing to have a specific setting, which is why, like, again, in, like, women's fiction, people love books set in, like, a, a forest or a vacation setting or an island or Chinatown, something more evocative than, like, or a specific, you know, a specific neighborhood somewhere that has a feel or a flavor, I think, is always more compelling than, you know, setting something in the suburbs outside of Cincinnati, nothing against the suburbs outside of Cincinnati. And I'm sure there's a way you can make them interesting, um, but it doesn't feel as evocative as these sort of very specific kinds of settings. So I think it was the setting. Um, it was the family dynamic. Um, it was, I love anything with magic. So that was very appealing. Um, and I think just this idea, and I do think this is appealing, uh, very appealing in women's fiction, this idea that it's somebody searching for their place in the world, right? Is, is, and that's sort of always a journey that you see in fiction, not just women's fiction. I shouldn't have said that. In any fiction, I think, is about people searching and what to, to, to feel at home, to find a home. And then I think that was very appealing um, as part of this pitch. Mm -hmm. and, and Roselle, how much querying had you done up until this point? 
Um, not that much because I just finished a novel. Okay. <laughs> so this was, this was pretty early on in your, in your journey. to. Uh, yeah, it was pretty early on. I parted with my previous agent and, and I'm querying this new, this new book. I was rushing to get, get it done and revise it and make sure it's as good as I can get it like shape wise before I even entered the pitch contest. Mm-hmm. And did you have like a plan of attack for querying this? Was was DV Pit sort of the first stop along that plan? My plan of attack was I wanted to make sure I, this is for anybody who's left basically had, who's had a previous agent, like, you know what you want the next time. And yeah, Jenny was at the top of my list <laughs> <laughs> for looking. Cause it, it's like, you know what you want in a agent relationship and all of that. And it's not your first, it's not the first time getting an agent. So I was a lot more um, picky with who I wanted to query mm-hmm. second time around. And, and Jenny, another thing I, I love to hear is whenever, when, when a query first clicks, was there a moment in this query where you realized this was something you wanted to see? Well, I really like the pitch and, and Roselle is right. I mean, the comp titles are really helpful and I'm, this is why I'm always telling people like the comp titles are so, so helpful. Um, so, um, you know, what I, so I sort of had two, two processes. Like first I saw the the tweet and I was like, oh, that sounds really good. And then I got the letter and then made the decision, oh, do I want to request the whole manuscript? I don't actually remember because this was a long time. Like, I don't remember that exact moment, but I really do think like right from, um, right from that very first paragraph, I think it's extremely compelling. It sort of has so many of the elements that we're talking about an evocative setting, complicated characters, um, magic, and the, the, the sort of hint at what this character's journey will be. So it's, it's a really kind of masterful first paragraph because it, it manages in one, three sentences to fit all of that in. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you mentioned comp titles, and, and I was going to get to that as well. Do you, why are comp titles so important for you in, in, in figuring out if this is something you want to take on? Well, it's been such an interesting conversation lately about comp titles. And Roselle, you've probably seen some of this, right, on Twitter about how comp titles are actually kind of a barrier to entry for BIPOC authors. Have you seen that, Roselle? I think I've seen it because I think it's because um, the when you're dealing with BIPOC authors, there's such a limited amount of material that you can comp to. And so it's sort of, yeah, yeah. sorry, I just cut you off. No, that's, that's, I think that that's what it is. Yeah. And then it just sort of leads to that argument like, oh, well, we can't find any successful books to comp this to this book too. So therefore this book cannot be successful. And it turns into this self-fulfilling type of situation. Um, The way comp title, comp titles function in different ways for different people. I think for agents, they're kind of a shorthand for us. They're a way for us to very quickly understand what kind of book it is that you're writing, both in terms of genre and in terms of plot or approach or whatever. Publishers are using them to make buying decisions, um, which then, which does get you in that more complicated um, territory. But mm-hmm. did I answer your question? I feel like I just rambled. Yes, no, you definitely answered the question. I got, like, I, it's just that's, that's been such an interesting discussion lately about comp titles and how they're actually harmful that it's like hard to talk about them without referencing that mm-hmm. important and necessary discussion, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to talk about the magical realism in the story as well. Uh, Roselle, you include that in the query that there was magical realism. How heavy is the magical element to the story? And has that continued through... Your, your other two books? Uh, yes, that's all in, it's all in there. And it's, um, it's a very, it's a very subtle magical realism or fabulism is a very subtle kind of magic that occurs in everyday ordinary life. And for me, I can't really imagine writing a novel right now without it. What, why do you feel that? It's just because of how your writing style or just, is that something that you just have to include in every book because it just feels natural? 
it feels natural because like for me culturally i grew up with like the weirdest superstitions like chinese superstitions like i have an auntie tell me oh you want to get taller just jump up and down if you keep doing that you will get taller <laughs> little things like that like and all of these to me like when you look back on it it's just a life of like magic ordinary magic and i can't like i find that my for my writing it's just a part of it mm -hmm. I, that, I love that. Uh, Jenny, whenever we did our literary fiction episode, we, we had a similar situation where the query didn't mention magical realism, even though there were small bits of magical realism. Is there a certain amount of magical realism you have to have before you mention it? Or do you just, should, if there is any, you should mention it? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I have no idea. I, like with query letters, there's no one size fits all. Like, and I certainly like would not put down a book because the the person did not mention that there was magic in it. And then I started reading it and there was magic in it. That would not be, you know, something that would disqualify you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I want to talk about the, the plot that's revealed in the query as well. Um, I know you, Jenny, you said that there's no one size fits all with queries, uh, but this does seem like a query where there is a lot of plot revealed. Do you prefer that? Do you prefer to see a lot of plot in a query? I want to know what the book is about. And I want to know that there's going to be a beginning, middle, and an end, and that the author understands what their own plot is. Mm -hmm. Especially with commercial fiction, obviously. It's much more important for commercial fiction. So, yeah, I and I and what I really don't like is when the query letter, and maybe this is just my own bias for commercial fiction, like when a query letter talks more about themes or ideas than it does about what the actual story is. I want, I don't want you to give away the end, particularly if there's some sort of like twist ending or something. And Roselle's, this book has like a phenomenal twist that I will not give away, but like that is, is not even referred to in the letter. Um, but I do, I do want to know that you understand plot. And the best way to do that is by being to encapsulate it successfully in your pitch. Mm -hmm. and, and Roselle, did you worry about giving too much away in the plot or, or, or did this just sort of all fall in into place? I wanted to make sure that I left enough in there that it would infer at least the, like, Jenny would be able to see where it's going. Mm -hmm. Like one of the most helpful exercises I find is that writing a query letter before you even write the book. So you know where the book is going. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, so last question about the query. Uh, Roselle, there's no mention of, of the books that were to come in this series. Was it always your plan to write more books along the same vain to get into Vanessa Yu and Sophie Go, or was this sort of like a standalone that just happened to turn into more? Um, this was a standalone and the idea for Vanessa kind of, it was, Vanessa I call it a unicorn book in that it was easy to write and it wasn't that bad to revise. The third book is not like that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but like times are hard for everyone though Roselle like don't be too like everybody's struggling so whose idea was it then to to keep going with this series did it start with you Roselle it's not, it's not a series it's not it's really not a series like they pa they're packaging them to have a similar look um but they're really linked standalone they're 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 standalone books the first two anyway the third one isn't even going to be linked mm -hmm. um but they're standalone books that are loosely linked by a character who's appearing in both. Right, Roselle? Is that how yeah. you would? Definitely. Yeah. It's For me, it's the three books. They're common thematically in family, food, and a character's self-journey. Mm -hmm. I like that. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing the query. Now, before I do that, is there anything else that either of you want to draw attention to in this query before I move on to some audience questions? I would just like point out, I mean, if we're talking about like what makes a good query, mm -hmm. um, this really is a great query. And um, I liked that. I think a lot of times people um, think like, I know like for their bios, they're like, but I don't have credentials. Like I didn't do this. I didn't do that. What do I do? What do I put in my bio? Like to me, this was a perfect bio because She's, show, she's letting me know that this is like what her identity and how that matches along with the plot. 
uh, I mean, along with the, the storyline. And she tells me where she lives, which I find interesting. And, you know, she tells me about her degree. So I just want to point that out. Like, that's very well done. And, you know, she, it didn't bother me in the slightest that she did, that Rosell didn't say she had an MFA from somewhere or she hadn't been published these short stories or anything like that, particularly for commercial fiction. It just does not matter. Um, so I just, the bio was really good. Oh, and she did her word count, which is great. A lot of people leave that out. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you pointed that last paragraph because I did want to bring up one last thing, which is that the title changed. How, how often does that, is that something that people should understand will probably happen, Jenny, or, or do most titles stay the same? Um, titles change a lot. Not always. Um, I think what you want to be careful of is, um, is sort of saying, oh, well, the title's going to change anyway, so it's not important. Because even if it changes, it's super important. And a title is often what grabs your, it's like sort of one of the first ways you have to, to get an agent's attention. And I've said this on Twitter before, and people like thought I was kidding, and I wasn't. When I like would go through query letters, often I, and you know how the title will be in the subject line, the way I decide, like, if there, if I'm just overwhelmed and there's a ton, I'll go in and read the ones that whose titles I like first, just because I'm like the author gets it, like the author knows what makes a good title. The author has a certain awareness of how to present their book that right away. So they're right away telling me something, even if that title ends up changing. They're telling me something important about the fact that they know how to position their work. And Roselle, were you attached to the title at all, or were you, or were you fine to see it change? I was fine with it. I know. I think Jenny and I spent three days brainstorming titles before. So. <laughs> I feel like we did it really last minute too. Like, I feel like all of a sudden I was like, oh, you know what? We need a new title. <laughs> like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to hit send. But like, mm, you know what? We need to come up. So was it, is that right? Like right at the last minute? we were. Just it was, like, like, it was three forth. days. And I think you were crowdsourcing TBA as well to see oh, which ones yeah. they liked. Yeah, uh, that's great. All that's right, so, fun. Like, I like that kind. Like brainstorming is fun. So we, I think I feel like I mean, I had a good time. I don't know about you, Rose. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to stop sharing that query. And then before we get an audience questions, I, I always ask for recommendations, uh, a couple of works of commercial fiction that you feel like aspiring commercial fiction writers must read. Perfectly fine to plug your own books. Obviously, we, we've gone over the titles of yours, Roselle, but if there are other books Jenny, that you represent, that you feel like commercial writers or aspiring commercial writers should read. Um, just a couple titles that you can think of. We'll start with you, Jenny. Oh, you're starting with me. I mean, I'll do the ones I just held up because I, and I think these are good because they kind of straddle that line, you know, like Roselle, where it's like, it's it's really book club. With, so um, The Flood Girls, which is a story, it's set in the 90s and um, it's, the story of a woman, a recovering alcoholic, a young woman who comes back to her small town. And again, this is one of these books where the setting takes over. It's this super quirky small town, almost like Twin Peaks, but without all the like crazy murder and craziness. But she comes back to her small town to make amends, to, to work through her steps of um, Alcoholics Anonymous. And befriends a young gay boy who's living next door to her trailer. They're in a trailer park and it's really, and starts playing softball for this like crazy softball team. Uh, and this is actually one of those books where it doesn't have the same kind of plot arc. Like it doesn't have the beginning, middle and an end. So I think it would be interesting to read. It's, it really is kind of very character driven. Um, and kind of lurching from event to event to event, but it's the setting and the characters and the voice are so rich that you don't miss that plot arc as much. Um, and then this this was the other book I held up, um, which is historical fiction set in Singapore and Malaysia in the 20s that has kind of a, it, there's a kind of a murder mystery and a, a tiger that might be magical and again so evocative like the setting is just did you read this Roselle did you ever read this one I, think you, I, I don't did, know yeah. on the spot but like it's you know it's again like it's that hint of magic it's that totally evocative world I like books that take me somewhere I've never been so if it's either you know 
it's colonial Malaysia um, or it's a, a crazy small town in Montana, it's still, it's someplace, you know, I haven't lived, I haven't experienced. And, and Roselle, what, what kind of books do you recommend? I'm going to recommend a romance that I've uh, blurbed recently, and it's called Loathe at First Sight by Suzanne Park. It's going to be out in, I think, two weeks after my my book, and it's about a Korean a Korean uh, woman who's working in the video game industry and what that's like. Hmm. Oh, that sounds fun. It does sound fun. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump over to some audience questions now. Uh, Jenny, I'll, I'll pose this one to you. With, with literary fiction, backstory is very important. How does backstory fit into commercial fiction? I think the same exact way. It's like what I was talking about before when I'm always saying to Roselle, why, 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 why did this character become a matchmaker? What in her past has made this important to her? What, you know, what was her own love life? It's, it's, it's super important. I mean, and it sort of informs everything. It's just like, real life like why do we do any of the things we do it's all about that backstory does that answer it I don't yeah know. no definitely um roselle next question for you a lot of people are curious about the interviews you have with your characters before the story what kind of questions are you asking in these interviews do you follow like a a, a sheet of questions or do you just kind of see i'm trying to remember which craft book i got it from I can't remember if it was anatomy of a story. It was, I'm going to have to look that up, but basically it's just a bunch of questions about family and relationships that you can kind of tell where that, what that per what your character is going through or what they have gone through. If they have good family relationships, if they've had any romantic relationships, how, what were the previous ones? How did they end? It just gives a lot of the rich backstory. Mm -hmm. And then I'll often ask authors who, when they need to fill out their characters too, I'll just be like, what's, you know, if you had to give this character three characteristics, what would they be? Are, is she feisty? Is she argumentative? Is she, is she shy? Is she, you know, just give me three. And then also I will always want to know how do they change? Like who are they at the beginning of the story? Who are they at the end of the story? Um, but even answering like really basic stuff like that is sometimes helpful mm -hmm. so we got a question here about comp titles so jenny i'm going to pose this to you person says they read voraciously but they still they're still trying to figure out the, the most relevant comps it, aside from just reading more books is there a good way to go about finding comp titles comp titles are so hard because you can't you want to stick sort of in the same genre right so if your book is commercial you don't want to comp to something super literary um you you don't want to pick anything too successful, right? Like you never want to, you don't want to comp to, for a long time, everything was Harry Potter or Hunger Games or, so you don't want to pick something that was like massive giant. Um, but you also don't want to pick something that nobody's ever heard of. Um, sometimes you can kind of go classic meet something else. So you could do like Anne of Green Gables meets, um, it's like a big best big commercial bestseller. I mean, it's not a good, do you know what I mean? Like you could pick something like a, a classic that I immediately have a point of reference to and comp it to something modern. You can do movies, you, but you don't want to have two movies. So you could do a book meets a movie. Um, uh, look at the times list. That's a, like, it, it is important to know what's working. Um, but you don't want, again, you don't want that massive breakout, like don't comp it to Crawdad Sing because it, that book is such a phenomenon that it, it's, it's too much the, the exception. It's too much of like an exception, like nothing is going to work as well as Crawdad, so you don't want to comp it to Crawdad. Except you kind of could comp it to Crawdads because it's hard to explain. Like if you had, if, if you had something that was like a spin, like if you could be like, it's like Crawdads, but with set in... Chinatown, right? Like that would actually not be a terrible comp. Um, that would sort of make me interested. Mm -hmm. But I know that's not that helpful. I'm sorry, they're super hard. No, that was very helpful. That was, it was very good. Uh, Roselle, curious, what, how did you find your comp titles? Did you just read them and realize these would be good comps? 
I usually when I pitch anything to Jenny, it's always either a TV show or film and then a, a novel. So she can get like a good feel of what the book the book is. For the third book, I comp the movie The Farewell with I think um the matchmaker the matchmakers for beginners. Gotcha. For that one. Uh next question for you, Roselle. Uh, somebody wants to know what your experience, when you were searching for an agent, what were you looking for? You mentioned Jenny being on top of your list. Why was that? Were you very specific with who you were looking for? Um, first thing, first tip that I would say is your favorite books, look in the back, read the acknowledgements. Usually the agents are listed there and that's like the perfect way to start building your query list of who, who you want, who you want to query because you enjoy these books. And you know that these these agents are looking for these kind of books, and that's that's one of the tips for me. It was I needed somebody who was just who was just like I don't know how to describe it because when you get your first agent, it's like a marriage. You don't know what to expect, whether it's going to end in divorce or whether it's going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> for if you've been if you've been through that, your second one, you get to be a bit more you get to be a bit more specific and how you know your communication styles like do you do you prefer to do it through email do you prefer to communicate through phone calls or through whatever like you just know you you get to know what you want mm -hmm. in a relationship mm -hmm. yeah no that makes sense uh jenny I'll, I'll ask you this next question when do you know to give up on querying a book if you're not getting any traction I, 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 there's probably not a hard and fast rule, but is there any advice you give somebody that feels like if there's no traction, when do you move on to another project? I actually don't know the answer to that one. Roselle, do you know? Cause you have a, like a million writer friends and you've done it. And there is for me, it's the advice that I would give is I think for, for my first book, for the debut, I queried, not the debut, I think before that I queried, the book before that I queried over a hundred agents. Now you could also look at your book and realize that gauge the market to see what's being acquired and what isn't. If vampires are dead or if you're writing right now, if you're, if you wrote about a pandemic right now, maybe you may want to shelve that for a bit, unless it's nonfiction, shelve it for a bit and then wait until the right time to to, to query it again, not to give up on it, but just to understand what's going on in the world and what, what may or may not work. Like you could always shelve it and then query it later. So I say, don't give up on it unless you know you've written a better book and that, that book is the one you should be focusing on the next book. I mean, hmm. that's good advice. Um, so Jenny, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Curious to hear what you say. Uh, a gentleman <laughs> wants to know, can a villain be the main character in commercial fiction? Is, is there a place for that? Well, there's that book, You, right? Isn't that from the perspective of the um, the killer? I haven't read it, but I yes. think it is. Um, I think it's, I, the, you know, I, I think it's often where I, something I'm not, I don't notice as much as, other people, other publishing professionals, is whether a character is sympathetic or not, because what I care is, do I understand them or not? So, but there is this real push, especially in commercial fiction, to have sympathetic characters. Um, so I think if you are able, I guess the answer is if you are able to do it in a way that at least some people will find sympathetic. Um, like I remember that book, The Luckiest Girl Alive, that was such a big bestseller. And I remember talking to an editor and I said, you know, I think that book is interesting because I find that main character so unlikable. And I'm always told, you know, that, that my character has to, you know, when I'm submitting work that, oh, this character isn't sympathetic enough. I didn't sympathize with this character, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I said, you know, she's deeply unsympathetic, I think. And the editor said, yeah, but I understood it. I understood it so well. So that's maybe the, you know, and again, like you're not going to please everybody. You know, if I send a book to 25 publishers and eight of them bid, that is wildly successful. That is a hugely successful, su I can't talk, successful <laughs> auction is eight bidders. So you're never, ever going to please everybody all of the time. Mm -hmm. So last question here. 
I, I always like to end with parting advice. If you give one bit of advice to commercial fiction writers, what would it be? Roselle, let's start with you. Um, can you start with Jenny? I need like maybe a minute. <laughs> I'm so happy he started with you. I was like, yay. Well, I mean, that's so hard. One piece of advice. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I do think it's important to know the market. I'm not saying you have to write to the market because I don't think that's necessarily going to work, but I do think you have to understand and be aware of the market. Um, which is again, like where sort of comp titles come into play where you kind of know what's working and what's appealing and I mean, there's so many other things, though, and I just picked that one on the spot. Like, there's like 500 other things. Of um, course. Uh, Roselle, did you think of one? Yes. Um, read. Read what, you're, read what you're writing, which is... Mm. That's it. Like, you can't write about something without reading, without reading it and getting to know the genre really well. Mm -hmm. And Thank you. Uh, so... Real quick before we go, Jenny, you mentioned having like a graph of, of between plot and character. Do you mind sending that to me? Because a lot of people are asking if they could see it and I can just send it to them. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll, um, I'll email that to you. That'd be great. All right, so this is where I say goodbye to you guests. Thank you both so much for being here. You were, you were enlightening. <laughs> thank you so much. You're a really a great, great moderator. That was really fun. And Roselle, thank you for joining me because you made me, it made me feel so much like less nervous to be able to see you. I looked down at one point, we've lost some, but I looked down at one point and there were like 133 or there were a ton of participants and I was like, oh, it's so overwhelming. Well, you both did so great. <laughs> All right. So you both are free to go and I'm just going to wrap up the show here with a couple of announcements. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Oh, I can leave. All right. For those of you that are still here. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we have a few announcements to go over. The uh, Let me share this real quick. The Gotham Writers Conference is going. Uh, if, if you have a project or if you just want to learn the ins and outs of the publishing industry, we've got all kinds of panels and presentations to help, to help bring light to what goes on in the publishing world, as well as our pitching roundtables where you can pitch your story uh, to two top agents in your genre. Uh, it's a four-hour process where you can spend a lot of time with an agent, so it's good FaceTime. Um, also, for the Twitter pitch party, if you have a, a commercial fiction book that you want to pitch right now, as always, after the show, you get the chance to do that on Twitter. If you go and you pitch your book with the hashtag P-I-T-G-O-T-H-A-M, that's Pit Gotham, you have until Friday at 11.59 p.m., also known as midnight. Uh, and, and once you submit those pitches on, on Friday, I will collect them, send some of them to Jenny for feedback. Uh, some general tips. It, it was nice to see what, what Roselle had pitched with hers. And if you do want to see the query, again, feel free to email me. It's josh at gothamwriters.com. Um, but some general tips for how to, how to pitch your book in a tweet. First off, make sure you condense your book pitch into a single tweet. We don't take multiple tweet pitches. But if you have more than one book that you want to pitch, you are welcome to do so. Just use separate tweets for each one. Also, we talked a lot about comparable titles. It's very, very helpful if you can have a comparable title or two in your tweet. Um, focus on what makes your book unique. You see that's the protagonist and the main drive of the plot. You don't want to try to give the whole story away. Just introduce the story and leave it with the hook. Um, and then lastly, again, make sure you include hashtag pit Gotham. You do not have to tag anyone. Just as long as you include the hashtag, I will be able to find it. If you don't include the hashtag, I cannot find it. Uh, lastly, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we have a special episode of Inside Writing on August 12th. We're going to be evaluating query letters with two agents on the show. So if you want to have your query letter evaluated on the show and hear what the agents have to say about it, email that query letter to me, josh at gothamwriters.com. I'll take as many as I can and, and, and pose them to the the agents and see what they have to say about it. So next up, next week, we are going to be talking about picture book writing on Wednesday. So until then, thank you all for being here and I'll see you next week.